Great. Thanks, Anne. You know, before I just start signing, um, and those who don't have access um, to the sign language, uh, I will also explain that we are working with uh, ASL English interpreters who are providing sign language and English interpretation for everybody tonight. That's okay. Just one second as I work to advance my slides. There we go. First things first, we do need to acknowledge that we are here in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded land, and we work across Mi'kma'ki, Konazgumguk, and Beskodomagat, and we work under the Peace and Friendship Treaty, and that was signed in 1725, and that is still ongoing to today, and we work all over Mi'kma'ki. And I'm very grateful to those who allow us to work on these lands. And I also want to be grateful to our amazing team, both internal and external to St. Mary's. Those are still working with us and those who have graduated and carried on in their careers. And thanks to our colleagues at DFO, the Aquatic Invasive Species uh, Partners, Nova Scotia Fisheries, who have been working together uh, with me for many, many years now. And also the hard work of the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Councils and all the work that they do. And as you continue watching the presentation, please do keep an eye out for their names because they will come up again as well. So thank you for all the hard work that these partners have contributed to this realm. Oh. And somehow I've tagged myself as Linda Campbell there. I, I don't know how I did that, so please ignore that. And so I work with environmental contaminants, and I have for quite some time. So why am I also now working with invasive species? Well, it really has to go down to food webs. Wherever you go, if you're looking at how contaminants are moving, you do look at food webs. If something has come along and joins a food web, you will look at those alterations. It may get longer, or shorter, more simplified, or more complex. And we need to understand how contaminants are moving within those food webs. And then at the same time, we need to know the species role within the food web and the ecosystem of the lake. And so I have studied food webs, and I'm very privileged to be able to study food webs in many different areas, as listed here. And it doesn't matter where I've gone, I have found introduced species. I found invasive species. The world is the way it is, and we need to find that understanding of the invasive species, the theory of invasive species, management, as, along the same lines as we're monitoring for contaminants. And I'm very thankful for the people that have worked alongside me over these years that have provided me access to the lakes and the knowledge and the relationships in those ecosystems. And I'm very grateful, as I said, to those people that have worked alongside me. And so there's two main reasons why I'm focused on this presentation this evening, really. One is why we care and what can we do? I'm hoping that I can convince you that why we should care. <laughs> and then once I've convinced you that we should care about these critters, then we should talk about what we can do. I will provide some background and context so we have a, uh, an understanding of what our options are, what we know, what we don't know, and then what we can do. So, first of all, we do need to come to a common understanding of what an aquatic invasive species is. Often that is abbreviated to AIS. There are definitions of aquatic invasive species. It is an organism that has been introduced or transplanted into an ecosystem. And what's key is that species has had its own evolutionary history in another system. It's been there for a long time, and it doesn't have the same evolutionary system to where it is being transplanted to. It hasn't evolved to be in that new system. 
And typically they are labeled as organisms that reproduce or grow that can then harm their new system they're introduced to. So that means that not all indigenous species are invasive. You know, there's some gray areas there. Uh, depends on who you talk to. But basically, it's a species that, you know, may not reproduce easily, it may not move or spread, it's easily managed, or it's stocked with a desirable fish species, or it's an introduced species that humans feel that there's a benefit to keep. And then if it's one of those, it's considered a non-invasive species. So there's some uh, murky areas there sometimes. We're not going to go there tonight. <laughs> so what is a non-Indigenous species that we see here in Nova Scotia and in the Maritime? We have a whole list. And what we're seeing here is just a couple of examples that I pulled from that list. Some are very local, like the yellow floating heart at the top left. It is localized to one lake in Dartmouth, but is in a very profound impact to that one lake. And then we have the Chinese mystery snail, which is a very large snail that is quite widespread now. I won't speak to each and every one of these, but we'll focus on zebra mussel, chain pickerel, crayfish, and a new one for all of us, uh, thermocyclus crossus. And it's a very tiny uh, organism in the top right. If you were in a room with me, I would ask for a show of hands to see if anyone uh, knew of it, but uh, let's assume that a couple of you know of it. <laughs> As I said, I will only just speak of a few of these in a couple of case studies for the presentation this evening. And so, as I said, these species come in from another system and arrive here, and there's many vectors. And there's many vectors on how they get here. So from the pet store trade in different aquariums, maybe in a beautiful garden pond in your backyard. When you go fishing, you have live bait. FYI, earthworms are invasive species, just to let you know. Or they could be introduced either legally, uh, illegally, or through permits. Or it could just be a, a, a mishappened an unintentional vector. And then there's also ballast water as well. That's not as a large deal here in Nova Scotia, but there are other areas that are impacted by ballast water. And so it comes back to why should we care? And these are different documented impacts of what invasive species have done. Depends on their ecosystem, their habitats, their mechanisms of introduction, but these are some impacts that they can cause. So we do see a loss of species in our food webs. We see impact to water quality. We see change in habitat. You see this really gross biofilm on this image right here. We see food web alterations. We see contaminants bioaccumulation. And we see a growth of harmful algae blooms as well. And there's a, there are others, but these are just the most important that I wanted to demonstrate this evening. And as a human, why should we care? Because, okay, I don't care. It's underwater. I shouldn't care, but we really should care. We use our freshwater lakes for multiple purposes. Uh, we go recreationally swimming. We go to the shoreline for various reasons. We have properties on the shoreline that have their own property value. We feel a sense of belonging along the shorelines and to our coastline. And so, again, these are just a couple of the impacts that we see. This is a very 
famous image that's for plant biology, and it's an invasion curve. It's been applied across the board in very many situations when it comes to invasive species. The y-axis shows the area of invasion. It could be the number of lakes that's been invaded, the area that has been invaded, the number of species found. There's many ways that you can measure the impact of the invasive species. The bottom, the x-axis, is the timeline, and it's divided into three categories color-coded here. So we have lag phase, exponential growth, and carrying capacity. You'll see some different versions of this image depending on the scenario that it's applied to, but this is the graph that really started them all off. The point of this is to demonstrate that if we introduce a new species to the system, and there's just a few localized that hasn't yet reproduced, that's called the lag phase. That is the best time to eradicate this invasive species. As the numbers grow, typically that's when people then see this invasive species. It is possible to eradicate it if you move quickly. And as you go up the curve, you get into the carrying capacity phase, and it's at that maximum level, and that's where well, you face some challenges. I'm just going to link. I'm going to let Hank Bird into the meeting here. <laughs> I see him in the waiting room. Um, so, all right, and so back to my slide. File monitoring is incredibly important through all of the phases. We do need to be able to see what is happening with these species. We want to have early detection. We want to be able to monitor the spread. And it's a very important tool, as I said, throughout the entire process. Biosecurity is what you can do to prevent or limit the import or the introduction of these species. It is one of the most important tools that we can have in our toolbox. And then bio, bio surveillance as well is when you're monitoring and detecting early the arrival of these species. There are some overlaps in these, but the approaches of bio monitoring and surveillance and security are slightly different. Ideally, we'd have biosecurity to prevent anything coming in, but in practice, that doesn't always happen. And so I do have a table now to uh, go into a little bit more detail that's very colorful, but uh, it's not mine. It, it does follow along with the invasion curve. So just bear with me. I'll walk you through this. I'm trying to make the case that there is an economic return on our investment and effort, that as we go through our phases, the more and more time and money we have to exert, the less we're going to get back on our return. And so when we look at our biosecurity, it involves different people. It involves inspection at the border. It would involve import and export. And then we look at who's involved and who would have to pay any of those prices involved. It would be maybe federal government, of course, and maybe provincial government. It would be import and exporters. And then at the bottom, we look at our economic return or return on investment, our ROI. The idea being is how much that we would invest into preventing these invasive species coming in, we would have a very high return on investment because we wouldn't have any invasive species to worry about. But as we move on to the localized, just one or two species here, early detection that we can eradicate, typically the federal and provincial government are involved in that stage and they bear the cost for that. Maybe some private owners, utilities, that, because that might be impacting their particular area. Early detection is very high, 1 to 25. And so, again, investment and your return is worth it, right? Because you can take care of your ecosystem from that localized small location. But as it starts to spread and you're starting to impact private homeowners, businesses, utilities at a grander scale, you're paying the cost 
and the property owners and business owners are paying the price and all you're doing is slowing down the spread at that point and it's incredibly expensive and your return on investment is decreasing and you're spending more and more money and once the species is established in your system all you can do at that point is just manage it on a weekly a monthly a yearly basis and your return is that you're spending so much money and you're not getting much back ideally you're be investing most of your effort in the biosecurity stage and early detection as we go through the case studies keep this in mind and we will keep come back to this as well and so it comes back to why we should care about invasive species is because of our economy there was a very good study recently done around the world and it was collecting information from databases on invasive species impacts plants, agriculture, forestry, aquatic, marine, all of these different sectors and how it impacts everything and the costs for all of this, let's say agriculture. And so they pulled all this data together on the database and it was published by Crystal O'Malis in 2021. And it shows that the estimated cost Sorry, I just have to move a couple of things around on my screen to see it. Um, so we're looking at U.S. funds right now. Is $307 billion since the 1960s, and that is looking at North America alone. And that's for aquatic, semi-aquatic, evasive species in North America. A agriculture and forestry is higher, of course, because that's a natural resource. That's money that we could be spending on other areas, and I bet you would agree with me on that. There are unfortunately no studies in Nova Scotia. There's a, a few pieces of information here and here, but no comprehensive report. I could find some information from Ontario, though, that I pulled together for our presentation. So this is an infographic that I pulled from Invasive Species Centre in Ontario. And I also included a link that is shown here as well. They estimated that the total cost for municipalities and conservation officers and authorities for the year in the province was $50 million. And then at the side, you can see some breakdown of those costs. And the Conservation Authority in Ontario does not have a large budget to spend. And so basically, they're managing invasive species with their budget. So again, not a great return on investment. All right, so what do we know about invasive species? A lot of it always comes back to the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes is one of the largest freshwater ecosystems in the world. The Great Lakes and the African Great Lakes and the uh, Bengal Lakes are the three largest freshwater systems in the world. And uh, not surprisingly, they're all struggling with invasive species. So the Great Lakes are struggling with the arrival of invasive species from the Ponto Caspian region. Oh, excuse me. That's Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and it's because that is where a lot of our import-export shipping comes from. And so these species are coming all the way from Europe. Uh, you may be familiar with this, but just bear with me. It's coming through the shipping trade. So when we look at our Halifax Harbor, you can, you know, I can see it, I, I can look out my window, but what they do is they fill their ballast with fresh water from the Ponto Caspian area. And it's actually to help them balance with their cargo. And when they arrive to the Great Lakes, to its fresh water, it's more, it's less dense. And so they don't need their ballast. And so they dump it to help balance their cargo and their ship. 
but they're taking ballast water from the Ponto Caspian area. And there's a lot of interesting things in that water. And so basically the ships are transporting a full food web as well as the cargo that we're getting to our imports. And so I have a timeline here that I'd like to show you. And so Mike Willie sent me this. Thank you so much to him. And so this graph, I did adapt slightly for the presentation. It shows the number of invasive species that have been detected on an annual basis. It is cumulative. And so right now we know of about 200 or more species that have arrived to the Great Lakes. And that's in the over the last 200 years or so. So it's about a, one species per year. And so the first type of invasive species that we noticed was a type of weed. And I'm going to show some important landmarks that really opened up the Great Lakes to these invasive species. And what we can learn from this is what also we can apply to Nova Scotia. And our first landmark was the building of the canal system that connected the Great Lakes to the ocean. The Welland Canal in Niagara Falls area was our first landmark indicated here. So when you connect the Great Lakes with the Atlantic Ocean, well, we see a lot of familiar species right here. So alewife at the top, and here we know it as gaspro. And then lamprey, that's very common here as well. And other species as well came along. Alewife just loved the Great Lakes, and they thrived, and they started pushing out other fish species from their ecosystem. And so people were worried. And so what they did was they started a massive, large-scale stocking regime of salmon in the 1960s to manage the alewife population. They did do some stocking of salmon before that, but we're talking at these thousands and thousands of uh, fish levels, and we're talking state and provincial level at this 1960s mark. And now there's a lot of industrial dependence on the salmon for recreational fishing. The next important landmark that I want to illustrate for us all was the establishment of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Are we seeing a pattern here at all, folks? And so that's when the Ponto Caspian species start to come into the Great Lakes. Things started to slow down when they started forcing yeah. offshore water exchange. So they weren't allowed to do it in the Great Lakes, they had to do it offshore. But other species did come in, but not at the same high rate as before when they were doing ballast exchange in the Great Lakes. And so the cumulative impacts for the Great Lakes are very complex. Basically, everything I showed you in the slide with all of those impacts and landmarks, all of that. <laughs> but the shoreline has more algae blooms, the waterways and drains and pipes are more clogged, fishing collapse, food webs have become more simplified, just as examples. The Great Lakes are just a massive test tube experiment. And it's unfortunate what we can learn from that. All right, so bringing it back to home in the maritime, there's a lot of people working on invasive species on the coastline, green crab uh, and the vase tunicate. And there's about 22 known invasive species in the marine system. Fabulous work being done. And I often look at that to learn from what we can do there uh, and apply that to freshwater. However, for freshwater, well, huh, 
<laughs> and there's not as many people working on those issues. <laughs> it is improving though. So here's a case study about why we should care about invasive species in freshwater. And so this is a recent discovery that I'd like to share with you. Very recent discovery. And so I'd like to introduce you to this lovely little creature. It's about one millimeter in length. Not very many people are aware of this guy. It is originally from Europe, Central Asia. Are we seeing this pattern? Are we seeing a pattern here? So it was found in the Great Lakes in the 1990s uh, in high numbers. During the pandemic time, we planned to do some zooplankton studies we, to establish a baseline. Just that, just a baseline. We weren't looking for anything in particular. We just wanted to know what was there in the community. So Kaylee McLeod, she was working on chain pickerel as a topic at that time, and she happened to find this zooplankton in her hall, just, just happened to. And it was, a uh, oh, what's this? And we have a colleague in Quebec that we were talking to, and they found a zooplankton in their lake in the same year. And you can see the St. Lawrence River very close to Montreal, where we can see these spots indicated. If I can get the pointer to work, I can indicate that. Let's see. So that's for Quebec, and this is for Nova Scotia. Okay. The one lake out of several in Nova Scotia that we found the species in, and only three individuals. Oh, all right, no big deal, just a couple. But that could be early detection. No. Maybe now's the time. And in Quebec, we think that they're from ship ballast water is where they're coming from. Um, How did I put my name there again? Sorry. Okay. All right, that's better. <laughs> it's not me. That's not me. <laughs> but the Shed Ballast Water is an important source because it is along the St. Lawrence River when we're thinking about the Quebec system. But for us, we don't have any ships going through Wenzel's Lake. It's a very tiny lake in the La Haye system. And so we think it's from bass fishing or sport fishing tournaments. There's a lot of boats have live fish twelves. And so quite often these boats travel for tournaments all over regions and in your own area, and if you don't have a program for clean, drain, and dry, <laughs> and if boats are allowed in that have not yet been cleaned, where do you think they're bringing in their fish wells? <laughs> and so this should be a heads up for all of us. We caught it early enough, maybe. It's still challenging. And so why do we care about this obscure zooplankton? Because it's planktivorous, and there are other planktivorous species that we are more concerned about. And so I'll go on to that in our next slide. And so our friend the zebra mussel. Zebra mussel. This is a freshwater mussel with zebra mussels along its mouth, and so it cannot open. And they're actually choking the freshwater mussel. They're starving it to death. But the zebra mussels are not that big, and you're like, eh, we'll see them. It's fine, we can use our eyes to see them. They were first found close to the New Brunswick border in 2022, and it was through eDNA work and sampling. It was found in Grand Falls, New Brunswick. And DFO does fabulous works doing some tracking of them down to find them. But where, what does zebra mussel have to do with planktivorous zooplankton? Well, we have to look at their life cycle. They have about 30,000 vectors a year. And they're planktivorous. And you can see the man with the net there. 
the mesh is very, very fine mesh. You could use it for your coffee to strain it through and you wouldn't get any grit. It's very, very fine. You would need mesh that fine to collect these and bring them back to the lab for analysis. And so if you have a boat with a fishing live well and you have such tiny organisms, what do you think is going to happen when you transport your boat to the next lake without a clean drain and dry program? It could be a boat, waders, canoe, kayak, it doesn't matter. Without biosecurity, it's just a matter of time before zebra mussels make their way to Nova Scotia. So we certainly should be concerned. And so now to talk about some organisms that we actually can see with the naked eye, chain pickerel and smallmouth bass. They're both beautiful fish. They were introduced for sport fishing purposes. And we have a wonderful team of researchers working on these fish. They're working on very different ecosystems in southern Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, New Brunswick. But they're all finding the same thing. Tame pickerel is impacting the food web. It's impacting contaminant, contaminant accumulation and it's impacting species at risk. That in and of itself is a whole one hour lecture, which I'm happy to do. But let's get back to why we should care. Cane pickerel are an eating machine. They will eat everything and anything that will fit into their mouth. So the ecosystems can be altered within seven to 10 years of the introduction of chain pickerel into the lake. This graph shows the number of lakes with chain pickerel documented in them since 1940 when they were introduced in Yarmouth. And it's all the way until now, the 2020s. And uh, you know, I, I think we've we counted enough. We, that's, that's enough to found. And we found two more lakes actually last summer that have chain pickerel in them. So that needs to be updated. So I think our is closer to 210 now, I believe, that have documented chain pickerel in them. But let's look at this curve. Does it look familiar to us? It's just following the theory. And so I say we're now in that red zone that where we need to be in a control and management only. I don't think we're going to be able to get rid of chain pickerel out of 200 lakes at this point. Another thing that I wanted to talk about this evening is crayfish. Crayfish are delicious, right? We've got lobster just out in the oak fish, and crayfish are just tiny versions of them, right? Just freshwater versions of lobster. But in Nova Scotia, there are no indigenous crayfish at all. Our lakes have not evolved with crayfish in them for thousands and thousands of years. This particular crayfish that you see in the image, a very uh, fancy crayfish, is a red swamp crayfish. It's from southern um, states and northern Mexico originally. It's culture there, it's where it's from, but unfortunately it has been introduced worldwide. And recently we found it here in Nova Scotia. This is Madison Bond with her first crayfish that she found. And because they are a warm water species, we were hoping that the cold temperatures would limit the spread and reproduction of the crayfish in the lake that we found them here. Unfortunately not. Madison actually and her team found a juvenile. You see that teeny tiny little creature? What is it, about four millimeters in length? This guy right here, just a little baby juvenile. She found it a couple of weeks ago. The water is very cold. The crayfish are still reproducing in our cold water. So we will continue this research to have more findings. And thank you to our partners at DFO who are working with us.
to hopefully get them early enough where we can do something about this. And crayfish is a concern is because no one has been looking for it until now. The table that I'm showing you now is of crayfish in different locations. The blue at the top is ones that we know are being sold here in pet stores or aquarium trades. We know that they're here or being sold for bait. The gray is crayfish that have been found in Nova Scotia and has been verified. So there's two so far. Oh, yeah, we found one more recently. And then the yellow is what's been found in New Brunswick. And that's been found by Dr. Donald McAlpine. He's been the one that's found those in New Brunswick. And so, so far we found quite a few. And you can see the different species here, red swamp, spiny cheek, and so forth. And then we have some of the pets trade at the very end, uh, the Mexican miniature. We actually use them in our lab for experiments. And so I worry about them here because they're so small. You can actually order them. They're super cute. Please don't introduce them to a lake, though. And then we have rusty crayfish. They're invasive in Ontario, something that we do need to monitor for. And so you notice that in the list, there's an asterisk next to one of them. Yeah. And it's yes with an asterisk because DFO and Nova Scotia Fisheries have had a third crayfish report in Nova Scotia, southern Nova Scotia, that may be that species. It has yet to be verified. We're very worried. And so let's talk about why we are worried. It's a beautiful crayfish, right? But this particular crayfish is the only crayfish known to be parthenogenic. And so what that means is that it is self-reproducing. It basically clones itself. And so it's an offspring of two from uh, from two and some, some, somehow the chromosome numbers got mixed up. And so one individual had enough chromosomes to be able to start reproducing itself. And it just happened in the German aquarium trade. They have no indigenous habitat. There's no home. A male has never been found anywhere, only females. You know, really think about it. It's quite amazing how this happened. And now it's invasive across Germany. And so you have one crayfish. You don't need anything else. One's enough. You just drop that in and she's good to go. She can reproduce. Ontario just had their first report of a marbled crayfish last summer, and so right now we're just waiting to see through the identification process what has happened in southern Nova Scotia. So please, everybody, when you go out, look for crayfish. And so in Ontario, do you know where they found it? The crayfish was walking along a hiking trail. It wasn't even in the water, it was just going along a trail. So keep your eyes open. Same as red strong crayfish. They're very tolerant of a wide range of habitats. It's banned in the European Union. It's banned in several provinces and several states. But not in Nova Scotia. All right, so we've gone through some case studies from small, large, a little bit freaky, um, and all of these different uh, species. So what can we do? So if we look at back at the invasive curve, we have three stages. And the best time is during the prevention, biosurveillance, biosecurity. Then we can do some containment work. And actually, when you look at that contain image, that's an electric fence. It's designed to keep carp from jumping and entering the Great Lakes. It doesn't work, just to let you know. Um, and then there's eradication. And then there's control, which includes education to limit the spread. And so I'll provide you with some examples now of what has been done. 
The Nova Scotian Invasive Species Council was able to purchase this horrible boat cleaning station and hopefully it will encourage people to clean their boats before they cross the New Brunswick Nova Scotia border and that's part of that biosecurity effort. There's some complexities at Pit Lace right now to get it operational but hopefully that will be implemented soon and uh, hopefully a lot of people will volunteer to take upon this service. Ideally, it would happen in New Brunswick as well. Another approach is, is early detection. So with the small zooplankton that we found in Wenzel's Lake, it just happened. You can't depend on scientists going to all of these lakes and taking up their halls and just happening to come across these creatures. We don't have the time or the resources to do that. And so people looking at environmental DNA, eDNA. And so we all excrete DNA that we can analyze. And the good news is that the cost of eDNA is decreasing. It is becoming cheaper. The field sampling is becoming easier. You can see this image. It's a field backpack kit, and it's like a Hoover, like a vacuum system. And you just send out the samples to a lab, and they do the analysis for you. But really, it is still expensive. You do need experts on your team to do the analysis. And it hasn't yet become 100% reliable as an indicator. You do need to parallel it with other tools to confirm the species presence. And so, to say there's more work to be done. But it is a good tool for high-risk biomonitoring if, for example, zebra mussels in New Brunswick, we know they're there. And there's eradication. You know, you're trying to kill as much as you can. And it did take place in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and it's using a chemical called Ropno, and that to protect the Atlantic Salmon Rivers. Smallmouth bass was found, the par young salmon, they find them quite delicious, and uh, they'll come after them and eat them quite up. And so they focus on the headwater lakes of the Atlantic Salmon Rivers, they're setting up barriers and all of the things and removing all the important fish species, but they sprayed these headwater lakes with rotino, and that was to kill all vertebrate species. The chemicals do break down over time, and then the lake will recover naturally. And so it is very successful, but it's expensive. And let's say there's 200 lakes with chain pickerel. Are we going to apply rope note to all of these lakes? Likely not. Only high value systems that humans value. And so, some challenges that we're facing right now is that we're very reactive. We're not being proactive. We're not planning for these. We're just reacting when things arrive. We don't have consistent practices for biosurveillance. We have no biosecurity best practices. We have data, but it's scattered. It's stored in various locations. We have wonderful risk assessments and risk management programs, but again, they're, they're scattered and they're siloed. So we have a species at risk. We have invasive species. We have plants and agri uh, agriculture. We have inspection. But we do need a way to talk with each other better. This is a report from 2012. It is outdated, but the conclusions still hold. It's ten, 10 years later and they still hold. Addressing aquatic invasive species in Canada is legally and bureaucratically complex. There are no umbrella way of approaching invasive species in a cohesive way. Other countries do have those approaches, but in Canada, we do not have that yet. And so in our next slide, I do have some examples that I'd like to go through. And so these are a few apps and departments, uh, regulatory groups that can apply to invasive species. 
Like, let's just say, I don't understand them fully. I'd have to sit down with the experts and go through these and understand how each of these acts and regulatory groups support each other, work with each other. And we're getting there. We are. But we need to get there sooner. Another thing that we need to plan for in terms of our risk assessment is climate change. We all know it's coming. And I did want to see if there's any climate change models for Nova Scotia when we look at freshwater systems. And we don't have any yet. But when we look at other areas where modeling of climate change impacts have taken place, we do know that lakes are going to get warmer. There's going to be more algae blooms. A lot of things are known that are going to happen. So this image here is from Ontario. And it's, so you won't see the same fish assemblies, but we can see some similarities. So uh, northern pike is similar to chain pickerel. We have salmon bass. And then we have cold water species, so trouts, um, salmon for sure here. But let's imagine that our lakes are going to get warmer with climate change. What will happen to the fish that we truly care about? The salmon, the white fish, mussels. They will be struggling. And they'll be less able to hold back the warm water invasive species because invasive species are typically those warm water species. All right, all right. So we've gone through all of this. What can we do? One, early detection is important. If you see a species that's odd, that's unusual, that's out of out of what you've seen normally, report it. So we have three options. You can go to DFO and they have aquatic invasive species. So there's contact information there. You have the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council, and they can facilitate a report with you. Or if you're really not too sure, or you're shy, if you have the iNaturalist app, use it. Or if you don't have it, please download it. It's a really fun app to have. And basically what you do is you'll take a picture, uh, it documents your location, and it helps to identify this species. And it, under, and it helps to understand the environment better. You know the Pokemon game on your phone, if you like that game? Very similar idea to the iNaturalist app. And we can also advocate. We do need better systems for biosecurity, biosurveillance, and we need to share monitoring and observation. Community science is very important. I happened to find three Ozu planktons in one lake, and it was pure luck. And our team is not going to be sampling all the lakes in Nova Scotia. And even other people who sample the lakes, they may not be looking at zooplankton. So communities are important. Support organizations in your communities. Let your MLAs know. Let your MPs know. Let your city councillors know what's up. To let them know to pay attention to these issues. And finally, on a personal level, there's many things that we can do. If you have a living organism that you don't want anymore, do not let it loose. Even if you feel, oh, this poor thing, don't let it loose. If you have a pet or fish or plants, you're not too sure what to do with it anymore, go to a recognized retailer. Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council have a list on their website of retailers, so check those out to know what to do with your item, and you're supporting businesses as well. And finally, encourage your local marinas and other areas that uh, may need these to have a clean, dry, drain and dry program impl implemented. Support those businesses to do the right thing. Thank you, everybody. I'll leave this slide here for a moment. I'm happy to answer any questions.